One's grade is a permanent record. Once transcripted, it endures forever. But there's no need to fear when the end result's clear, though the journey itself's always checkered. I'm Heidi Marks Morris, and I started teaching high school in 1995. Despite nominal retirement in 2015, I've been in the classroom ever since. I'm writing a book about what I've learned in my career because I want to help others experience the connections and joy that I have found in successful teaching. It's called Teaching Matters, and you can sign up for news of it at my website, MarksTeachingMatters.com. In an earlier episode, I talked about the philosophy of grades and whether they matter or whether they don't and how both are partially true. Given that grades are a fact of a teacher's life, to say nothing of a student's, I'm going to address my tips here on how to keep accurate, clear, consistent grades with the least amount of wear and tear on the teacher. Lessons I learned the hard way through trial and error over my years of teaching. I will never forget my very first big test that I gave in English 1, my first year of teaching. It was over the Odyssey. It was several pages long and it was all written. It was all long answers because in my naivete and profound wisdom, I knew that objective tests, multiple choice tests, were not a good measure of any learning. Students should be able to write what they know or express it freely. So I gave this large lengthy test to all of my students of whom I had, oh, classes of 35 or so. And some of the students did well. Most of the students did okay. And a few of the students did poorly. You know, the basic classic bell curve that you're supposed to see. I gave the test back and the students who had done poorly were very upset with how badly they had done, felt it was unfair, and asked whether they could retake the test. This was my first meeting of the concept of test retakes in high school. But thinking it through and deciding that I want to help the students do their best, I agreed to offer a retake whereupon many of the students in the class clamored to retake it as well. If they get to retake it, so should I. Yeah, I know I got a 78%, but I can do better than that. I should also be able to do my very best. I couldn't deny the validity of that argument, so I opened it to all students. And then the top performing student said, well, what if I take the retest and I do worse? Will that hurt my grade? Well, that didn't hardly seem fair, so I assured everyone that I would only count their highest grade. And we set a time for the retest. It was a really crazy modified block bell schedule that year, and so there was a time at the end of the day where all students who wanted to could come and retake the test. And I had far more students show up for the test retake than would fit in the desks I had. So students were sitting all along the walls, they were sitting at every desk, some were spilled out into the hallway, and I had written a new test. I knew that giving them the same test again was not going to show me the same amount of mastery. So same material, same length, but different questions, and they went to work on it. And then I went home with another entire huge set of tests to grade, and diligently plowed through the labor of marking all those tests and totaling all the scores. And I went to the gradebook to record them and discovered there was basically no difference between how the students had done on the first test and how they had done on the retest. Yes, of course, the points were not identical, but there were the same number of top performing students, the same number of poor performing students, the same class average, and students did not move from one category to the next. There were a few exceptions. Two or three students, this is 25 years ago, so I'm not entirely certain of this, but a few students had improved from failing 
to passing. But just as many students had moved from marginally passing to failing. I realized that I had put myself through hours of extra work to literally no point. Why had I done this? Why had I given myself so much more to do to measure the same outcomes a second time? That was my first and my last embracing of proficiency-based testing. Retests were not my friend because they didn't help me and they didn't actually help the students. Now, what does that have to do with grading? Well, I have learned that the most important component of effective and consistent grading is consistency. The expectations you set, the methods that you use, and the reporting that you give the students need to be clear, predictable, and regular in order to be effective. Now, what you set up as your parameters, is a, it's up to you as a teacher. For me, I have barred late work and I have barred retakes for the reasons that I just cited in the above story. Obviously, there are exceptions when circumstances necessitate for individual students with extraordinary life circumstances, absolutely late work and or test retakes may completely be valid, necessary, and humane. But by and large, my standard is you get one shot at the test and you get one opportunity at each assignment. And those expectations are consistent and they are clear and students meet them. This is essential to surviving as a teacher because grading 30 random late assignments is 10 times more time consuming and exhausting than grading 30 pieces of one assignment turned in at the same time. When you are consistent, your students are far more likely to be consistent and the burden on your shoulders is far less. So you are assigning and receiving back these sets of assignments. All of the vocab homeworks come in on Wednesday. All of the vocab quizzes come in on Friday. All of the essays come in on Friday, whatever your system is. Hold yourself equally accountable for the reporting back to the students of how they have done. I believe that online grade books where every student and every teacher can, I'm sorry, every student and every parent can see in real time the grades that you have, those are the bane of teachers. They elicit emails, phone calls, panic from, but I turned it in, but I turned it in, when you haven't gotten around to grading it yet. So I have thwarted the omniscient eye of the online grade book by recording my grades on paper throughout the week and entering all the grades every Monday morning. So I don't have to deal with the grade <laughs> conscious student and parent interrogations except once a week. But I am accountable to have my in baskets emptied on Monday, every kid gets to know where he or she stands in my class on a regular basis. And I print my grades and post them so that every student can take a look without the onerous duty of going online and checking. One footnote to the posting grades. Another lesson I learned over the course of time is to not post the entire grade book every week. Instead, only post grades from one week prior. It's just as effective at keeping things up to date. Finally, I want to address the how do you make your grade book accurately reflect the student learning. Most teachers assign points and every student understands 
more points, means a bigger chunk of their grade, and then you get into this currency battle of how many points do I need for an A? And what if I just did three more questions on this and two more assignments here, and would that get me enough points to exchange in the marketplace of education for the grade that I want? Rather than fight the points battle, I have gone to a weighted category grade system. Yes, each individual assignment is worth points, but let's say, for example, there is a, a worksheet for Spanish with 30 blanks on it, and the kids score them and they get 24 out of 30. They also have an assignment to do an in-class exercise that is worth 10 points. Well, if I put one assignment in out of 30 and one assignment in out of 10, Obviously, the 30 question assignment is three times the number of points and hence has a three times larger impact on the grade unfairly. So if you just weight the averages, the number in the denominator becomes moot. I never have succeeded in explaining this to students who are very clearly apprised of the points system but is for keeping accurate grades that reflect clearly the student's progress, I am fully committed to the weighted averages system. And it saves me the hassle of figuring out how many points to make something worth. Also, I assign every grade a category. For example, in Spanish, quizzes are different from tests which are different from oral presentations, which are different from daily work. So there are four categories of grades that each of those averages goes into, and then those averages are computed against each other. I won't go into all the math formulas, but it's pretty straightforward to write the equation, even in Excel, to compute a weighted average. And in my experience, that is the clearest way to reflect the overall journey of a student, both their daily diligence and their performance on the final test or the final oral presentation. A grade is not an event that happens at the end of the quarter. And so I spend a little bit of time every Monday going over grades with my students acknowledging their right to appeal if they feel anything in the gradebook is inaccurate. And I make mistakes all the time. Students can help me keep their grades accurate, and it's a team effort. And when we get to the end of the term, all of us know what the grades are. Far less stress on me, far less stress on the students because of a consistent method of valuing grades for what they are, a record of our journey and their learning over the course of the entire term, not just an event that falls out of the sky at the end without any rationale and without any mercy. So if grades matter and you swallow that pill, digest it, metabolize it with a grade book that is clear consistent and fair. But even if you do that, I have overridden my gradebook grades many times because I am looking at an individual, not a series of numbers when I make that final decision. I have never assigned a student a grade lower than the numbers report, but very often I have assigned a student a grade higher than the numbers report because grades are not the end-all, be-all of education.